Like many another inhabitant of London, I am from time to time drawn to the River Thames. To stand on the foreshore is to be momentarily suspended between the time of the city and the time of the river. Here, the nervous flickering pulse of dense human activity recedes, giving way to a turbid artery of flowing water. Open space stretches out, and we seem able to stretch with it. This past year, my various interests in the river, especially its tidal flow, bring me back to Greenwich, where I photographed some 30 years previously. My return to this riverbank site also connects me to an earlier period elsewhere, when as a sculpture student, I spent, spent time learning how to record archaeological site excavations. The meticulous methods of hand-drawn records revealing successive layers of deposition had then interested me as a way of considering the process of drawing as one of both revealing and obscuring. Renewing this early interest, I join a group of archaeologists in exploring a section of the southern foreshore. We examine architectural features revealed by the low tide, which involves the arduous process of scrubbing structures clean of river silt, learning how these have themselves changed over time. We are then able to undertake a brief and somewhat hasty process of observation, photographing and drawing before the river inundates the shore once more. I find myself, however, increasingly distracted and wandering away from the site. The patient methods of measuring and recording can no longer hold my attention. Attracted to the drift of rubble and detritus scattered along the beach, I'm more interested in the vagaries of what the river throws up on each tide, rather than determinedly digging down, exhuming, and archiving. Each stretch of the river bears traces of its history, and this place is well known for its perpetual offloading onto the beach of shards of bone, fragments of pottery both more and less ancient, clay pipes, and miscellaneous items of everyday rubbish. It is the bones that capture my attention. Each high tide spills deposits in sinuous mounds which trace the force of the waves against the lie of the land, drying out as a jumble of stained osseous lace. Where do these bones come from? Archaeologists tell us they are the butchered remains of animals from either the slaughterhouses or the kitchens of the many palaces and houses that have lined this part of the river over the past few centuries. Absorbing pig, sheep, cow, horse, and rarely human bones, the river acted and still does as a depository of waste to be flushed away. The anonymous deposits have a certain abject quality, for living flesh shrinks from the touch of bones stripped of flesh. Some are honeycombed globules or sculpted blades, some blackened or spongy, others brutally sawn about. Heaped up, they shock with the violence of their numbers. They're excessive. Talking to Martin, an osteoarchaeologist on the beach, he tells me, this one is a thoracic vertebra, part of the backbone in the chest area. Ribs come off it. The big blade bit is the spinous process. You can feel the tips of your own if you run your finger down the centre of your back. It's probably a sheep, but the spinous process is a bit chunky, so it's just possible that it's a pig. Martin tells me that it's just possible that this is a pig. Not that it once was a pig, but that it still is. The skeletal fragment appears inert, but in everyday speech, the animate still lingers. At the same time, the smooth planar curves of the bone seem to partner the curve of the wash cast by passing river traffic as if it had been formed simply by the pressure of water. I feel a melancholy compassion towards the exposed remains of animals which once breathed air, gave birth, and suffered before their flesh was consumed by humans. Re remains which now seem valueless dross, apart from what they can tell us about the human existences they once served. I wonder if my ambivalence about picking them up is some kind of misplaced sentimentality on my part, or whether it is because a ghost of animal sentience still clings, for they exert an uncanny attraction. Or is this attraction something more primitive, the vague pull beyond memory of our own fluid beginnings, our cellular heredity? I read Manuel de Landa's account of the evolution of animal bones. He says, 
Soft tissue, gels and aerosols, muscle and nerve reigned supreme until 5,000 million years ago. At that point, some of the conglomerations of fleshy matter energy that made up life underwent a sudden mineralization and a new material for constructing living creatures emerged, bone. He goes on, mineralization names the creative agency by which bone was produced and while bone allowed the complexification of the animal phylum to which we as vertebrates belong, it never forgot its mineral origins. It is the living material that most easily petrifies, that most readily crosses the threshold back into the world of rocks. Unlike fossilized bone, living bone is flexible and porous at its core, continuously remodeling itself, a vibrant coral in the ocean of our bodies. Collagen, marrow, calcium and phosphate mineral salts, crystals of hydro hydroxyapatite and stem cells all work together to maintain homeostatic equilibrium and regenerative metabolism. Living bone also contains wandering cells called osteoclasts. They bustle around constantly dissolving old bone while osteoblasts rebuild and replenish the material mesh within. It is the work of these wandering cells which eventually allows me to call up between my tongue and teeth the word mineralization, the process which also makes eggshells the exoskeleton of crabs and tortoises and gallstones. While tapping out these words on the screen, I pause to reflect upon the thickening bone in my left middle finger. At 17, this finger became infected, and although it seemed to heal then, I can tell that throughout all the years since, under the skin, the trauma has caused the bone around this digital joint to grow much larger than the others. The impact of a singular event may have effects that are not immediately visible or felt, but continue to radiate out beyond their source. Standing on the shore on the verge of the new year, the sun, even at midday, burns low in the sky. Today, I'm frozen to the bone. The river bones, as usual, are here, swept into new configurations. I watch the pull of the tide and listen to the rushing of wind, the threshing of Thames Clipper and drone of aeroplane and the distant grind of the city at work. A glowing orange bobs past. The tide is on the turn as the spinning earth enters the new phase of its orbit, carrying our bones close once more to the warmth of the sun. The cyclical diurnal rhythm of repetition and return provides a certain reassurance to existence, and the shuttling rhythm of the bones back and forth both confirms this reassurance and disturbs it, for their indexical link to mortality is a reminder of the limitations of individual human historical time. The orange bobs back into view. London's waste is absorbed, taken into the flow of the river, and then comes drifting back to remind us not only of our profligacy, but also of the effective, evolving power of materials and the surprising way in which discarded objects take on another life outside their original use value. Rotting rubber gloves, desiccating plastic, fraying rope, rusting transistor parts, dissolving bone, all doing something on their way to becoming something else. In Vibrant Matter, Jane Bennett remarks, Nietzsche called this flux of matter in continual dissolution and resolution will to power, considering the operations of will to power to be as evident in the procedures of chemical reaction and bonding as they are in organic growth and competition, artistic creation and interpretation. I hold a shard of bone in the palm of my hand. The weight of water has evaporated, leaving a hollow, walnut-like carapace of burnished sepia touched with chestnut brown, a miniature cranium. It almost floats, it is so light, lined on the interior with a delicate tracery of trabecular channels which once held marrow and stone cells. Within the halo of my attention, the object seems to metamorphose, coming out of itself. The ghost of the dead animal draws back and allows an architectural vitality to emerge which is as vividly palpable as the once fleshly living animal. Once my hand is exposed to the shard of bone, it seems to act as a conduit to transmit a power of affection, reminding me 
that I have something of these mineral shards inside me. Feeling this, I have the sensation of being strangely turned inside out. Manuel de Landa again tells us that the human endoskeleton was one of the many products of ancient mineralization. Yet that is not the only geological infiltration that the human species has undergone. About 8,000 years ago, human populations began mineralizing again when they developed an urban exoskeleton. Bricks of sun-dried clay became the building materials for their homes, which in turn surrounded and were surrounded by stone monuments and defensive walls. This exoskeleton served a purpose similar to its internal counterpart, to control the movement of human flesh in and out of a town's walls. The urban exoskeleton also regulated the motion of many other things, luxury objects, news, and food. Cities arise from the flow of matter energy, but once a town's mineral infrastructure has emerged, it reacts to those flows, creating a new set of constraints that either intensifies or inhibits them. Travelling to and from the river's foreshore as the months pass, my fluctuating preoccupation with bone casts the environment in a certain light, as if a quality of boneness is infiltrating the leaden city skies, the granite and clay underground caverns and tunnels, the huge glass and steel monoliths. The soft and yielding bodies of strangers moving through the dusty air are each sustained by an architecture of bony fibres. Invisible, bone is everywhere. On the south bank stand the stone monuments of the old Royal Naval Hospital and Greenwich Observatory, designed to celebrate Britain's imperial past and her territorial claim to be at the centre of chronological time through the establishment of the Greenwich Meridian. While these historical monuments have become a kind of fossil hardened by history, the limestone substance of their Portland stone is soft and porous. Exposed to erosion, they are outward facing. On the north bank at Canary Wharf, the brittle cellular infrastructures of the towers dedicated to the urban flow of investment capital are impermeable, vulnerable to internal collapse. Between these exoskeletons runs the river with its cargo of quickening life and unpredictable force of inundation, a river whose molecules run through our bodies. Michael Ann Holly, in discussing the romance of writing about objects and images from the past, says, The objects from the past stand before us, but the worlds from which they came are long gone. What should we do with these visual orphans? The shards washed up on the shore at Greenwich did indeed originate in a past world, and scientists use processes of extraction and amplification of the DNA codings sealed in the cells of fossil bone to assist in the search for genealogical origins and a placing of them in time. But here, the milieu of the river and its local currents allows them an existence which conjoins with the oozing of the mud, the heat of the sun, and the mineral constituents of the water. Skeletal parts in tune with the time of the river drift inland, briefly rest, and then withdraw. In only intermittent contact with our own transient presence, they resist use value or the pressure to give up their secrets to be consigned to the stasis of permanent classification and archivization. Rather than following a desire to rescue so-called orphans from abandonment in order to restore a lost and prefigured past or resuscitate a presumed dead object, could we instead imagine objects from the past as ongoing molecular matter, a lively and self-organizing cluster of singular parts with a rhythm, rhythm of its own, in conjunction with all the other rhythms the matter comes into contact with. Osteo material is then no longer trapped in the past as an inert resource for the expansion or security of human knowledge, but is a dynamic and effective force responding to powers outside our awareness. While DNA may be proposed as a form of archival storage, biological DNA itself is also a kind of intelligent self-writing text which endlessly redraws life in dialogue with the unexpected environmental influences. This is a power which lies outside our human-centered horizon of purpose and which needs nothing from us. 
It is the spring equinox, a time when the moon is closest to the earth and its gravitational attraction is strongest. The tide is high, mineral shards jostle and regroup. I feel the resonance in my own body of this pulling force, just as my act of writing is drawn towards the force of its object. This act of writing is blind, feeling its way towards a material expression. There is a sensation of a stirring up, a shuffling and mingling, a wavering and a scattering. Drifting thoughts in search of expression temporarily settle as words spelt out, but these words can be dissolved and reconstituted, coming together like strings of molecules only to split apart again. Just as wandering cells break down and rebuild bone inside us, the brain has plasticity and is able to reorganize itself by breaking and forming new synaptic connections between cells in a process of autopoiesis. I see a wave breaking upon the limits of the word, once wrote Virginia Woolf. Word image here echoes the convolution of mind turning over upon itself of thought as the matter of language and language as the matter of thought. Rather than a fixed visible form, the word image becomes a molecular catalyst engendering the movement of desire coming up against the limits of expression. Scientists have recently identified what are termed place cells in the brain that enable a sense of place and navigation. Such cells may be scattered far apart or close together as part of a place field. They have no definitive pattern. These nerve cells are dynamic, constantly adjusting and remapping the field in response to the current location and experience of the body, and are themselves part of a complex circuit that informs place awareness and place memory. The link between neurological awareness as a creative process of spatializing and the embodied act of inscription then becomes a temporal practice of place, informed by the place of the writing. I am back once more, almost a year to the day since I first began to spend time on the foreshore. The archaeologists too are back, busy at their tasks of scrubbing, examining and recording. The extent of shore revealed at low tide varies, and it takes a keen attention to recognise the turn and speed of the incoming flood tide. I'm approached by an observant member of the archaeological team who warns me about the rising of the tide, which once it begins is surprisingly swift in cutting off exit to the embankment. However, it is less my physical presence but that of the camera placed on the ground before me which is in danger of being washed over and pulled into the river. With each passing boat, the disturbance of the water in tandem with the incoming current brings the body of the recording camera into ever closer contact with the river and the risk that it will be engulfed. But the camera has another part to play, which is less about the risk of physical damage and instrumental dysfunction, and more about the interval its pivotal positioning in the field opens up, allowing an exposure to and a temporal gathering of. The camera performs within the field despite and because of its point of view figuring as a clearing and a temporary holding relation for a play of interacting elements, processes which are themselves indeterminate, which may increase energies or deplete them. The image here can be understood as event assemblage, an event which places us within a field of energies not asking not only how we are situated with regard to, but also how we are immersed in and in contact with. This is both an ethical and an aesthetic question. As Stephen Connor, writing on Isabel Armstrong's material imagination, comments, the aesthetic is important partly because it is a way of holding play and disintegration together. The aesthetic is quite simply what keeps us alive, in which a scattering and loss of energies is part of life forces. The aesthetic is a process of mediating experience which the eye is included in, but not exclusively in possession of, can be figured here as the relational assemblage of material circumstances gathered together, which at any one time creates both a practice and an expression of place as meeting place. 
Such an expanded field of the image in negotiating the relation between psychic experience and materiality becomes itself a thinking interval, inviting a reconsideration of the integrity of self. River currents and burn cells, written words and light receptive cells, building and auditorium, the speaking voice and the listening ear in the here and now are drawn together in a taking place which is simultaneously one of emergence and withdrawal, escaping containment and conclusiveness. And here, words and recording are fast running out as somewhere the tide flows in. The image, therefore, considered as a form of active mediation, tolerates distance and non-closure, working not towards reconciliation and unity, but rather allowing a scattering of ungathered shards of leftover, unassimilable parts. No image but effective relation, a way of drawing attention to the invisible in the visible and acknowledging the desire which is the undercurrent of this address. <laughs>